morning, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today on this really important breakfast briefing all around pursuing international growth. So uh, my name's Sarah Lethbridge. I'm the Pro Dean for External Engagement here in Cardiff Business School. It's my role to help the outside world come into the school and find out more about the work that we do and the work of our partners. So we're really pleased that you've come this morning. If you haven't already been part of our community, joined up and given us your personal details so we can email you regularly, please do because we'll make sure that we keep you informed of all of the latest developments that you can all attend. Got a few upcoming events, um, really great one in partnership with um, Cardiff University's Innovation Network addressing the skills gap. So um, if you're interested in that one, there'll be information about that in our newsletter on Tuesday the 19th of November, so that's coming up pretty soon. Our next breakfast briefing is going to be about Wales' pathway to net zero, and we're really lucky that Jane Davidson is coming to talk to us about that. It's a huge area for Wales, so we really need to get organised to make sure that we're prepared and ready for it all. Um, and then, who's that on Wednesday the 26th of March? It's me! If you want to spend the day with me learning about service design as an evolution of continuous improvement methodologies, then um, please have a look at the course guide. It is a paid course, that one, um, to sign up to spend the day with me on Wednesday, the 26th of March. Welcome, or thanks. Fill in the hole. That's making me feel better. Great. So um, don't forget about our Help to Grow programme. Jane, lots of us in Cardiff University have multiple jobs, don't we? Jane, in, as well as all the wonderful research that you do, you're also the programme director of our Help to Grow program which is an amazing opportunity for small and medium-sized enterprises to benefit from lots of different academic perspectives on how to help your business to grow. Um, lots of wraparound support, peer-to-peer -peer, coaching, mentoring. It's a really well-funded program that is delivering great results. Guess what guys, I might teach you on that as well. So um, yeah, I talk about vision, mission and values as part of that program. Paul, you've just done it, haven't you? Sarah is amazing. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Pay you later. Um, so, yeah, please have a look at that program if you're interested in learning how you can grow. And guess what? You must be because you've come to this session. So it's a really good opportunity to couple and marry this session with a more engaged, longer form of learning um, to help you to develop and blossom and grow. We've got another amazing series of Public Value podcasts um, really interesting. It's a way to make our public value research be more accessible and to just listen as you're walking your dog. So um, please tune in, YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts. We really want to build and grow a momentum around these podcasts. So yeah, we'd really love it if you could give us 20 minutes to have a listen. And John, where is John? Beavering around in the background. Any sort of ideas? Oh, he's there. Bev's just pointed to him behind the screens. Anything you want to discuss around executive education, external engagement, John is your man. So please do get in touch with John Parry Jones. His contact details are there because we're looking for ways to collaborate with you. And that's the little join the community um, QR code in case you haven't yet joined, but I'm hoping all of you are already part of our network. So this session is being recorded. We are going to be taking photographs. So if you don't want to be part of any of that publicity material afterwards, please just let us know and we can make sure that you're not included. And at the, question, at the end of the panel session, there's going to be a question and answer session. So if you could, I'm terrible at remembering this, if you could wait for a mic, otherwise the people who've joined us online at home won't be able to hear you, okay? So please do wait for a, a mic if you're going to ask a question. Um, Oh, here we go. It's over to you, Jane. Um, I'll just give you a little bit of background about this session. Um, I love like happenstance and coincidences. And about the same time in the same week, Professor Jane Lynch said to me, I think we really need to do something on internationalisation and, and growth and exporting. And I said, all right, good, good, Jane, that's a good idea. And Paul Wong at a breakfast briefing, said exactly the same thing to me. So I knew it was a sign that we needed to bring these two brilliant people together to discuss a really excellent session where we can share what we know with you all and all the amazing support that's out available out there. So I'm going to hand over to you, Jane, my favourite bit, and um, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, it's a great pleasure here to be 
um, with you this morning to share what I think is one of the most important topics um, currently. Um, so my name is Jane Lynch. I'm a professor of procurement uh, at Cardiff Business School. And I'd just like to give you just a very um, uh, overview of the format, first of all, of this morning, but also then um, just a two minutes on why I think this is such an important topic of my own journey. So the way that we're going to run uh, this morning is we've got four fantastic panel members here today. Um, and each of them are, have been given seven minutes, although there's a little bit of discussion here about whether <laughs> it's going to be seven and a half and eight. And one says, if you have eight, I'm going to have eight and a half. So I think we have a bit of fun, but I think the most important thing is I've got my little two minute uh, sign here on the table. Uh, the most important thing is that we um, allow you opportunity for questions at the end. And if we don't get opportunity to answer all of the questions, because we want you to bring lots of questions to the discussion today, um, then we will definitely address them after the event and respond to you. All right. So, so that's pretty much the format. So you're going to hear from each one of the speakers. Um, but before we do that, I just wanted to uh, explain to you why I think this is such an important topic. So I didn't start out in academia at all. I started out as a buyer in retail, and if you could describe the 1990s era, around the early 1990s, I was a buyer in a much-loved department store here in Cardiff, and I can only describe that time um, as a little bit like the pandemic, where we've just seen acceleration of digitalization. Then it was acceleration of um, sourcing overseas, from marketing um, to, to, um, to, to, to sell your goods and products and services overseas as well. There was a huge shift, and it was a really fantastic success opportunity for many businesses, but it was also at the detriment of some, where they were claiming to have everything made in Britain, when in actual fact they were having things made in Turkey and labelling them as made in Britain, and, and thinking that the customer would, 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 would understand that that's true, when actually they realised that it wasn't. So... I realized very quickly that, you know, while this is an important transition, there are also a lot of things that you need to learn, first of all. So I actually took the opportunity because my role as a buyer completely changed from going to trade shows. They're still there, but going and having some chap turn up with his samples in a hotel room to actually having to go overseas when I had a, small, I had a young family at the time. I took time out, went back to university at the age of 30, um, studied my MBA, but to learn about supply chain management. And it was then that I started to teach, and I actually took on um, modules um, on international trade and e uh, political economics, can you believe it? I don't know why I took that on, but it was fascinating. But I learned a lot about some of the pit pitfalls that people were experiencing back in 2003. I then in joined Cardiff University in 2006 um, to take over two modules in purchasing supply chain management. And I embedded a lot of the learning and the teaching that I had in, those, uh, mo in that module of political economics and trade into my sourcing. Then in 2021, I heard about the Help to Grow Management Program, and I was absolutely delighted to see um, important agenda items such as strategy innovation, developing your market, and um, developing your opportunities overseas. And actually, I can see that um, we've got one of our, uh, we've got Dr. Boyne sitting at the back here who, who delivers one of those modules. So that started me to think about how much of a challenge this was and what opportunities there are today um, to help and support SMEs with international trade. So that's my journey and uh, a little bit about why I think this is such an important topic. And I think there is something like only 12% of businesses currently UK-wide um, that are taking up these opportunities. So obviously we need a lot more of those businesses to take up these opportunities. And so today is really about uh, understanding the opportunities that are available to you, and we're here to hear from the experts. So from that, I'm going to pass over. I'm going to pass over to our first speaker today, which is Jason. Jason, I don't know whether you want to... Um... I'm going to stand at the lectern. Okay, fantastic. And I think, so in terms of clicking our slides, um, for the logistics of it, fantastic. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Bodhidhar. It won't surprise you that the negotiation, whether it was seven or eight minutes this morning, was between UK government and Welsh government. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll try and keep to our seven minutes. Um, if I can get... Yeah. So, so this morning we're talking about uh, international opportunities. But uh, I also, I'd also like to think of this uh, presentation and Richard uh, and Steve as being able to allow you to access the right door. We're all here to help you access uh, 
international opportunities and the support available from UK governments, Welsh governments. Uh, so really, it's about no wrong door. There's no wrong way you can enter our support network. Um, I'm from the Department for Business and Trade. Uh, we're a small team in Wales. Uh, we are about two miles that way, and there are 12 of us. Uh, we were established about two years ago. Um, we cover the major sectors of importance to the Welsh economy, as you can see on the slide. Um, that may change as the industrial strategy starts to kick in and the consultation following the Green Paper um, comes to fruition in the spring of next year. Um, but we work in partnership very closely with Welsh Government, UK Export Finance, Chambers of Commerce in North and South Wales, Institute of Export, FSB, Academia and others. But we're here today to talk about exports. So we'll start with a few stats. Um, in the year to June 2024, Welsh exports totaled around £18.5 billion. That's exports of goods. That was down by about £2 billion from the year before. Um, exports of services are around £7 billion, but you'll be aware that um, getting information uh, on, on exports of services is more difficult and it's slightly more out of date. Um, and there are around about 8,500 Welsh exporters. Um, that's about 8% of the VAT registered businesses in, in, in Wales. Jane talked about the percentage. In England, it's about 10%. In Scotland, it's about 20. France is about 30. And Germany is about 40. So you'll see we have some way to go to catch up with some of our near, uh, near, near countries in terms of the, the exporting potential. Um, so we're here today to talk about how we can stimulate uh, more businesses in Wales to increase their export, uh, uh, their exporting. Um, so why would we sell internationally? Um, the Institute of Export and International Trade conducted a survey recently uh, of about 3,000 UK businesses, and around 80% of the businesses all reported that exporting had increased their company's revenue, had led to an increased headcount, uh, international trade had fueled innovation, and exporting had made their business stronger. But there are challenges. And you can see from the bar chart at the bottom of this slide that the ONS uh, Business Insights Survey early this summer, with about 10,000 responding businesses, showed that the main challenges were change in exchange rates, additional paperwork, um, change in transportation costs, and customs duties and levies have all been significant challenges to businesses. But hopefully you'll hear this morning about some of the ways that we can help you mitigate those challenges. There's an ecosystem of support in Wales that DBT, uh, DBT supp supp uh, supplies. Um, I'll, I'll list some of the uh, items on this slide, but not all of them. Um, firstly, greats.gov.uk. That's a wonderful landing page that brings all of DBT's export support services to business in a single place. Um, it's a free online information tool, uh, and it has articles to help businesses learn how to sell abroad, find the best country or product for their service, um, create export plans that are right for their business, and it help hi helps highlight how businesses can make use of the UK's new free trade agreements. And you all have heard of uh, free trade agreements with Australia and New Zealand in recent months, and the, the acronym that uh, is on not many people's li lips, CPTPP, um, the Comprehensive Pro Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, Richard just gave me a little round of applause for remembering <laughs> that. Um, that's due to come into, into uh, existence uh, near Christmas, I think the 15th of, 15th of December. Um, we have a single uh, export digital inquiry service where you can complete a form online that enters you into the world of DBT's export support. It's for all businesses looking for help in all nine regions of the world. Uh, it started as a support mechanism for EU exit or Brexit. Um, it then transferred into a support mechanism for companies interested or companies challenged by the Russia-Ukraine uh, a, a, a problem. And then um, uh, latterly, it's now opened up to cover all markets and all, all questions in all markets. So it can be two minutes. <laughs> there, can be, there can be some quite challenging questions that you have to do with European trade and that's your entry route into there. I'll cover Export, uh, Export Academy in a moment and our overseas network in a moment. Um, events and missions. DBT runs a full calendar of events and you can speak to me later about those. We have inward missions to help you meet buyers from overseas 
Uh, we've recently run them in food and drink, and we're having one for African um, energy and infrastructure companies in February next year. And I'm currently working with colleagues in England on a mission to Big Five in November, where we're offering companies trade fair access, networking, and meet the buyers in the market uh, when they visit the UAE. Um, we have an export champions network of 25 companies in Wales that give their time freely to help companies like yourselves understand the challenges and overcome some of those challenges with international trade. In Wales, there are uh, well-known businesses like Penderin, who are part of that network, Air Covers in Wrexham, and Concrete Canvas in Ponticloon. Um, UK Export Academy, briefly. Over 6,000 businesses have joined the UK Export Academy uh, since its inception, and over 450 of those were from Wales last year. It's an online free tool to help you uh, gain confidence and the know-how to sell overseas. There are masterclasses and events, networking, roundtables, online events, and in-person events. You create an account, you pick the online events you want to go to, and you learn from the export experts. There are essentials programs, there are masterclass programs, and there are sector and market programs. International Week is about three weeks away for us, and we're launching uh, an Unlock Europe series, which covers some of those more tricky areas of trading in Europe, such as rules of origin, VAT treatment, trade digitization, and the trade continuity agreement. So there are plenty of sessions there for those of you interested in Europe on the specific challenges of trading in Europe. Um, finally, our international market service, DBT, works overseas in over 110 countries. We have over 1,600 staff based in the UK and overseas helping companies, uh, with, uh, helping companies internationalize their service. Within this provision, there's an international market service and international market advisors where we have over 100 staff who are specifically there to help any company in any market access that particular export opportunity. They are for one-to-one -one bespoke advice, specifically addressing your business need, uh, diagnosis uh, and opportunity assessment. They offer market intelligence, a wide range of off-the-shelf intelligence for clients, covering practical themes and sectors. Both of those elements are free of charge. And at market rate, there's an overseas referral network. We've procured more than 300 um, third-party providers in areas such as human resource or tax or legal services that uh, are signed into a contract with DBT to provide services for the UK companies. Uh, that, of course, is at market rates. So the key message when I started was there's no wrong door. Whether you speak to Steve uh, or, or Richard or myself this morning, you'll access the full range of services from both the UK and Welsh government. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. I'm going to say that was the most unnerving second when you turned over the two minutes. <laughs> yeah, so, Borodar, Diochenbau, uh, Jason, it's great to be here today. As mentioned, my name is Richard Harris, and it's a pleasure to join you uh, today in Cardiff. I'm fortunate to lead, from my perspective, the best export team uh, service in the United Kingdom, working alongside DBT. And it's mainly and what we really want to uh, stress is that we have an ambition together to deliver the best support for companies across Wales. Um, and it's not an either or case. It's very much we work together as an ecosystem. And that's not just UK government and Welsh government. That is many others. And hopefully I'll get to that point in the presentation. So a quick bit of context. Um, so we have an export action plan for Wales and our core objective, which I get judged on every month, is to increase the number of sustainable exporters across Wales and to increase the volume and value of exports from uh, Wales. To do this, our ministers, we now report to Rebecca Evans, will, through a series of programmes, invest over £4 million to directly support businesses in Wales. Delivered under five distinct themes, inspiring exporters, building capability, finding customers, getting to market and working with others. And just we'll highlight some of those that are available to yourselves. Um, inspiring exports, one of the key things for us. As Jason said, we need to turn around and include, increase the number of exporters. Our new exporter programme is an annual programme it offers intensive support for a cohort of what were sporadic or non-exporting non businesses, in fact, like accidental exporters. As part of the programme, 15 companies will be escorted this month, or next month, sorry, to the Netherlands. They will see pre-arranged meetings with potential customers um, and then receive support post the visit to turn around and convert those opportunities into export wins. 
all 15 companies that attended cohort three are already exporting sustainably. We also have the Explore Export Wales Conference uh, last year or this year. We held that in the Cardiff City Stadium. It will be again in the City Stadium on the 13th of March and in Lundudno on the 20th of March. We'll be joined by Jason and the team, Stephen and the team, the Export Academy and others. This year we had 475 delegates attend. Uh, we delivered 25 export workshops, including uh, export uh, IP, licensing, etc. Over 400 one-to-one -one meetings were also undertaken with overseas market experts. And they came from over 40 countries, including the USA, China, Australia, India, the LATAC region, and with staff from both DBT and Welsh government. Um, we also included in there the exhibition over 20 ecosystem partners, including the IP office again, UK government, EBW and UK. So please do think about joining us there in March next year. Um, building capability, we have a team of international trade advisors. It's great to see Hayley at the back from our colleague from Business Wales. They act as a point of contact, not just for Welsh government support, but for all of the support across the network. Um, we also have a, an export cluster programme, provides support for over 320 companies across medtech and diagnostics, high value manufacturing, consumer products, clean energy and food and drink sectors and tech. It offers peer-to-peer -peer support and one-to-one -one support and sub-sector visits to the likes of the World Hydrogen Conference in the Netherlands and Cosmoprofit in Italy have been successful for the teams. On top of the ESS IM programme, as Jason mentioned, we have the International Trade Development Programme that can provide bespoke consultancy to boost export capability. And again, these work hand in glove with each other. In fact, it's more of a piece of a jigsaw as you work through. That fully funded programme complements the info that you can gain. Our export hub, hosted on the Business Wales platform, is a fully funded online resource and again enhances and, and works in addition to the information available on great.gov. Provides a comprehensive range of export tools, research material, and your advice you can access 24 7. We can also assist companies to enhance their export skills. Jason talked a little bit about the Export Academy, which is a phenomenal resource. It's fully funded. On top of that, if you're looking at turning around and taking your staff through accredited training, we are also able to support you to turn around and take forward that through the Welsh Government support. Finding customers, and this is why one of my jobs is probably the best one in the world. Um, our International Trade Opportunities Programme for a small fee can provide access to in-country business or consultants. We can jointly cons agree a consultancy brief. The programme can provide business information at a local level. It can also identify and contact potential customers and distributors. And for example, on a trade mission recently to Japan, we were able to support an SME from Astrid Munich to arrange meetings for them uh, with customers across Japan and put in uh, language support into the meetings with them to enable communication. As well as that, we have a global network, uh, Welsh government offices, Steve, uh, Jason just mentioned the 110 offices, thank you. Um, we then got Get Into Market. So we've supported over 170 projects in 23, 24 with companies traveling to locations including Singapore, China, South Africa, the Middle East, Europe, the USA, and Panama and Central America. We have a clear eligibility criteria, but this can help independent business development visits for companies exhibiting at trade fairs, exhibitions, and conferences by providing financial support towards the eligible costs up to about 50%. You're limited to three per annum, and we're really keen to talk to you all about that today. And Haley's here as well today. That can help you on that. Our trade mission program in 24-25, we are supporting 18 trade missions. We will be going off to Medica in three weeks with 57 delegates from across Wales. We'll also be doing Adipec uh, next month, Arab Health in January, Gulf Food in February, MRO, where the team currently are in Barcelona, uh, enjoying better weather than us. David, you should know that. Um, so we've got a great team out there. We'll also be doing the Games Development Conference in San Francisco and multi-sector missions to India, Singapore and Malaysia, amongst others. And earlier this year, uh, earlier this month, our Cabinet Secretary has just confirmed our programme for 25-26 will include Bio USA in Boston, which includes partnership visits to MIT, uh, Wales in Japan, because it's World Expo next June, uh, Money 2020 in Amsterdam, the Paris Air Show and clean energy events in Denmark, the Netherlands, uh, helping to deliver the green jobs and growth priority for our Welsh ministers. But it is also too important to recognise that we work in partnership with others. We are only part of an export ecosystem in Wales. It includes DBT. It includes UK Export Finance, the Chambers of Commerce, FSB, IOD, the Institute of Export and International Trade, IP Office, Industry Forum, for Academia, 
including Cardiff University, obviously, and the private sector, importantly, and we all have a part to play. The aim for us is to create the best export environment for companies and organisations selling goods and services origin originated in Wales across the globe. I've attached a link on the presentation to some of our export exemplars, some of which are also export champions. The likes of Limart from North Wales, who were part of cohort two of the new exporter programme and now export across Europe and the USA. Marlowe's Beauty from here, South Wales, part of cohort one of the new exporter programme and now selling their product range to work through urban outfitters across the USA as a result of that support. The Welsh FA, who has been supported to sell their UFA, UEFA accredited football coaching programmes to China and USA through Welsh government support and trade missions. A final rentals, another based here in Cardiff, who are disruptor in the car hire market, and who've gained business across the globe from Albania through the Middle East to Singapore. And finally, another example would be Health and Her, a female health brand who will join 30 companies, as I said, with us in Medica next month, having exhibited in Dubai in, with us in January, and already they are now exporting again from Cardiff to China, the USA, Germany, and others. The support in market has been not just through Welsh government staff in Beijing and Shanghai, but also through the team that Jason mentioned earlier on. DBT's team across the world are there to help you all. Um, I just want to say Diochenbauer, hopefully that wasn't too long. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for that, Richard. Very, very insightful. A lot of information there. Um, and at that point, I'd just like to um, to um, to highlight something is that actually, you know, I've put them on a bit of a challenge today, haven't I? Yeah, a lot of information in a short time. But the idea of this event is really to, to highlight some of the enormous wealth of support that's available. And we're going to follow up with a workshop invitation to you on the 26th of November, 2 p.m. for two hours, where we'll be inviting representatives from each of these teams to support you if you think that this is something that you're interested in, your business. All right, so I'll talk a little bit more about that afterwards. But for now, I'm going to hand over to Stephen. Okay. Um, Stephen Wilson, uh, basically my background is international banking and trade finance. I spent my career with various commercial banks, including in London, uh, both UK clearing banks and foreign banks, and that comprises of, shall we say, day-to-day -day international operations, as well as business development and structuring transactions. Um, I moved to UK export finance about three and a half years ago. Um, UK Export Finance is the relatively, shall we say, new brand name for the old Export Credit Guarantee Department, uh, which is the oldest export credit agency in the world. It was established in 1990. The way that we deliver uh, export finance is primarily working in conjunction with the commercial banks uh, on a very much risk participation basis. Um, particularly in the short-term working capital market, um, as well as long-term funding for up major to overseas projects, which can run for anything from 10 to 15 years. Um, to put it into context, last year we actually lent as uh, an entity 8.8 billion pounds to UK exporters, which consisted of just under 500 companies. 80% um, of which were SMEs um, of various sizes. Um, the way that we deliver finance, primarily short -term working, in the short-term working capital market, is that the um, application for facilities is made by a company seeking UK support to a commercial bank. The commercial bank would underwrite the transaction to the tune of 20% of the value, with the balance of 80% being supported by way of a government guarantee to the bank. Okay. Um, we have no input in terms of the actual financing costs or any fees in connection with that facility. That's what that's all very much down, down to the bank. Um, we, We also support supplier fares. 
uh, albeit that they are mainly held in London. That's primarily for big overseas projects where we're seeking UK companies um, to obviously provide UK inputs in terms of, so we've got UK content in terms of the actual, uh, in terms of delivering under an actual project. Um, we've delivered many large projects recently, including a new railway network in Turkey, road network, for example, in, in West Africa, and hospitals in Africa as well. Um, where it's appropriate, what I will do is work with Welsh businesses to help them structure transactions to make them work, where, for example, they may not be able to deliver uh, the uh, facilities through their own bank can sign post towards technical guarantee. Um, in terms of the facilities that we provide, the general export facility is the probably about 75% of the business that we undertake. It's a very flexible facility uh, to support a UK business. Most of those businesses will have been exporting for a period of three years to qualify, um, and they should, uh, to qualify, they need to have turned export turnover of 20% in any one of the last three years, or 5% in each of the last three years. Um, the maximum facility will be up to five years, and the maximum bank facility would be up to about 25 million. Uh, and over and above that would go towards what we call an export development guarantee. Uh, one of which recently provided to Erin in North Wales at the Shot and Paper Mill, where we actually put in 150 million euros into that um, Madam Cook. International trade is quite a quite a complex subject, but some of the some of the basics, in in my view, uh, I know we only had seven minutes, but effectively, as far as you can, is try and not fall into the category of being an accidental exporter, which means you start to export when you've had an inquiry in over the internet or something like that. Uh, and uh, you've then got to find your way through the actual process. Uh, as far as you can, get to know as much about the customer overseas as you can and have some, tr some knowledge of that market by asking some of the experts that are available, such as, such as here. And an, an example of that would be in many parts of Africa today, there are still exchange control regulations, which means that foreign exchange can't be remitted unless there's a, uh, an agreement from the central bank relating to that country. Um, in terms of methodology of trade, how you actually undertake that international trade, whether or not you're happy to trade on open account against an open invoice, either, either payment against 30 days credit or something like that, whether or not you look towards financial instruments such as a bill for collection or a letter of credit, Terms of payment are very much around INCO terms, of which there are 11. They were recently reviewed back in 2020. But again, very important to know who is responsible for payment of the freight and the insurance and where the contractual obligation starts and finishes so that, it, so that it's very clear. In that regard, look towards at least the pro forma invoice or a, or a contract or agreement. Um, that's really important so that, as I said, there's no misinterpretation in terms of the actual physical trading. Um, and from the practical side, very important to manage the currency risk. Um, it's not just all about selling in sterling in our own currency. Sometimes there can be major advantages of selling in the buyers, the, in the denomination of the um, of the uh, buyer of the country concerned. The most important thing is to mitigate the risk as far as you can, know who you're dealing with, seek advice from experts, speak to your bank, speak to the Chamber of Commerce, Welsh Government, um, or UK Export Finance. Thank you. 
you so much, Stephen. And apologies if for those of you who joined us online who struggle to hear um, some of that information. As I say, don't forget, we are going to be offering a follow-up workshop to this as well. Yeah. So what you've done now, what we've done now is you've heard from three different departments in government. Um, so just to um, to uh, to finish off with our speakers today, it's still I'm delighted to introduce um, a supplier perspective, and Paul Wong um, has very kindly offered to share some of his own experiences and insights. Thank you, Paul. Uh, good morning, all. Beatles of Dulla, Dirtford Dulla. Well, if we're doing international, I'll say something in my mother tongue. And if you work out what it is, I'll be super impressed. International trade. That's very scary. Why would you do it? That's how I felt when we first looked at it. We're a small company based in Wales. We do building projects. We deliver projects, things like I did the Children's Hospital for Wales. We've done some work with TechniQuest and expanding their facilities. Why would you do anything internationally? Well, we went to a Welsh government event. We said, have a look at the international market. Have a look at what is going on elsewhere in the rest of the world. So we went to the UAE, had a look at that as a first point. I thought, wow, there's a lot going on here. There's a lot of building work going on here. And there isn't the supply chain to meet everything that they want to achieve. They have demand. They want what we can offer. So you then got to work out, how do I get into this arena where I can start to do some business in this country? And that takes some learning. It's a different place. Some of the norms are very different. The culture is different. The language is different. But there are some similarities. They do want to do trade. They do want to do business. I think that's one of my contacts coming through now. So we did some visits. We took our time. We met various people who were interested in doing some development work. People, we did a lot in healthcare. So we met people who were interested in doing healthcare projects. If you go to a country like the UAE, and you'll find this for lots of other developing countries, they don't have what we have. They haven't got the level of healthcare that we have. They've got a lot of general hospitals, but they haven't got the like cancer care facilities like that we have in the UK. And they want it, but they haven't got the expertise. We do. That's the opportunity for trade, for them to want what you've got. So we were offered an opportunity of, would you help develop a hospital? Absolutely. It's right in our sweet spot. So we met with a healthcare operator who had some land. We said, can you bring the expertise for developing a hospital here uh, to do cancer services? And there was virtually none in the UAE at all. Cardiff has more cancer facilities just for Cardiff, which is a population of about half a million, depends where you take the circle, than the whole 12.5 million people of the UAE have got. They want it. They don't know how to get it. I did the same with diabetes. We have phenomenally good diabetes services here in the UK. They don't. They have something. 40% of people in the Middle East are close to or are diabetic. There is a demand. So we started to arrange contacts between people who provide services out there and who want our expertise. And what they do is they look at us and go, you've got some very clever stuff. We don't appreciate it half the time because we're used to it. As a bit of context, I thought, just get a feel for a place. So I'm only going to use the UAE as an example. It's small. Traveling from Dubai to Abu Dhabi is like going to Carmarthen. You can get around. <coughs> and one of the things I've found as we went through our journey is do a bit of research. Do a bit of homework. Now, when you go out there, you can either go out there and it's a bit chaotic, but the more preparation you do, for doing an international visit, the better it will be. Understand what is your trade, that what you could possibly undertake. Understand what is your bottom line in terms of doing a deal. Because 
agreeing a service provision or agreeing a product sale, they will be quite challenging in terms of what's your number. And they'll get to the number bit much faster than you would expect and than we do in the UK. Another very important aspect is we are dealing with different cultures and customs and people. I've sat in a two hour meeting, had a two hour meeting arranged for a development project. One and a half hours was spent on Premier League. You know, who do you think is going to win the Premier League this year? And how, what about the uh, transfer market? What's that looking like? And you, you're an hour into a meeting thinking, why are we talking about the Premier League? And the answer is, they're sussing you out. They want to work, they just want to get a feel for you. Do I want to work with this person? Can I get a bit of a rapport with them? And they'll spend a lot of time just feeling that out. If they don't, that'll be the end of the meeting. They want to get that rapport. For quite a few people, the trade is not important. If they don't do it with you, they'll do something else. Then in the last 30 minutes, something bang, right, how much are you going to charge me for this? You've got to be straight in there. They want to know a number. And you've got to be prepared to discuss that number. It's different from the way we do things. So do some preparation and be ready for that. What I think is fantastic is we have actually got really good support in the UK. These guys offer amazing support. UK Export Finance, who we've dealt with for quite a few years, is a phenomenal piece of British government. It has very good facilities, which can be complete game changers in you doing trade. Tap into and learn what those uh, facilities are, because it can help you, like it has helped us, to become confident in dealing with other countries and working out how to do trade. But our starting point is, it is scary. Once you've gone through some initial steps, it's very exciting. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much to all of our speakers today. Um, but particular thanks as well to the executive team for allowing that to happen, this to happen. But it wasn't without challenge. So when I send the list of speakers, the question that I was, was asked was, how come everybody in government is a white male? Good question. Can you do something about that, Jane? We can't let this, this event go ahead. We're a public value business school, and we really do prioritize equality, diversity, inclusivity. So before we go out to questions, so those of you are both online and in, on the floor, I've got a couple of questions, but I have to ask you, why is it then that the leaders in government, is it by coincidence that they're white male? Shall I answer first? So uh, mainly because my senior international trade advisor is in New England on holiday and my head of trade missions is in Spain. Um, we obviously operate uh, within the Welsh government. We have a prerogative, Rebecca Evans makes every decision. We only advise, but the team is, is you've just unfortunately got me today. <laughs> yeah, I'm um, unfortunately. No, unfortunately. <laughs> my, my team would say unfortunately, believe me, but normally Ruth would be here. Oh. Hayley's another brilliant asset, uh, worldly experienced in terms of exporting, and the team is, is balanced, but unfortunately, yes, I don't recognize today that oh. males you'll have a similar answer. Yeah, it's exactly the same. I, I had a quick uh, toss up of my team and, and, and we're half and a half male and female. Um, uh, and I'm the newest member of the team. My, my, my boss, my boss is, is on leave today, which is why you've got me, similar to, similar to Richard. Um, uh, and, and there are some uh, very experienced members of our team, uh, Sean Evans, dealing with the creative sector, or Gemma Nesbitt, dealing with the food and drink sector, who've been working with businesses in Wales for, for, for some time since, since the team set up two and a half years ago. So, so it's a look of the draw or unlook of the draw today, I, I think. I would say as well, in terms of our overseas offices, the, ch the entire China team is female. Yeah. The vast majority, 80% of our India team is female. Okay. Uh, the deputy director that leads all of our work in the USA is female, and the team is 50% female. And the head of international relations, uh, Ru Geraint, works through Fion obviously is part of the team so it, it's a balanced team but unfortunately we picked the wrong day or the short straws I think and not being on leave. No not at all I think we're convinced aren't we do give them a round of applause for that one thanks. Thank you.
Thank you. So um, before we go to online, have we got any long line questions coming yet? Do we know? That's absolutely fine. Um, so I think, you know, the first question that I would, uh, would, would like to ask really, you know, when we think about SMEs, let's be real here that in Wales, the majority of businesses are micro firms and small businesses. Do you think that these are more or less challenged when it comes to export, international trade? And I'll open the floor to any of our speakers. I think if you look at our export example, it's going to be the same as your export champions. You've got companies like My Salamat based in Newport to produce a Muslim prayer mat. Um, micro business in reality, there's two, three individuals there. Um, Marlowe's Beauty and others. Uh, Limart, they make uh, shields for prosthetic limbs. Mark was a Paralympic swimmer. Um, and these are companies that have exported to the world. It's, the key is knowing what your USP is. Yeah. The support's there, whether you're a multi... Actually, our sweet spot is SMEs. We don't tend to get involved with the, the major multinationals. They don't need government support until it becomes a free trade agreement discussion on export quotas, et cetera. But I think we got, we're very lucky. Uh, we've got a huge amount of fantastic born global companies uh, in Wales that are, are able to access markets overseas. And can, can I just add to that? I've, I've spent many years working in the southwest of England and the, the business demographic is not that different to the business demographic in Wales. Um, and uh, I've been in the department for a good number of years, and it's been really refreshing to see the number of very small born global businesses that we've been able to, to, to help. And part of the, the event today is really to avail everybody of the, the myriad of support opportunities that are available through, through all sorts of different organisations. And we can layer on top of that with Chambers of Commerce and, and, and FSB and, and other organisations as well. So I think there are opportunities for businesses of all sizes. Thank you so much. The reason I ask that question is because one of the areas that we cover in Help to Grow Management is about the scaling up. And we use case studies to help and explain that. And so I was particularly interested because we, so Wales is an incredibly beautiful, small, well-connected country. But only when you travel, you realise just how tiny we are compared to the rest of the world. And so, you know, these international opportunities are fantastic. But the ability to be able to scale up quickly uh, when you get those opportunities. So I wonder if you... Yeah, being honest about it, from a UK export finance perspective, it can be difficult for businesses probably under four or five million pounds to actually uh, benefit from, from those facilities. We are currently working on a, a new offer, uh, which would be a smaller uh, general export facility, which we're working in conjunction with a number of the banks with. Um, the other point to bear in mind is that from a bank's perspective, the bank are always looking to uh, get their return on capital. So at the end of the day, the, the facility's always got to be large enough for them to actually make sufficient, uh, sufficient returns on, on, on that money. So it can be difficult for smaller businesses. Thank you very much for that honest and um, very helpful um, reflection and hope and hope as well that 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 something that packages are coming to help and support and to be more included. OK, so now I'm going to invite any questions both online and from the panel. So first of all, John, is there anything online? There's nothing online yet. I think there's something okay. coming through, but Thank we've got you. one at the back here. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Dawn. I'm uh, an award winning international author. Um, I've been traveling around the world for the last seven years nonstop researching uh, various human rights and social justice issues. I've come back to Britain. I chose Wales over English, England, even though I'm England, you know, from England. Um, and one of the things that I found is a lot of people are very adverse to dealing with me because I've been out of the country for seven years doing the work instead of using online platforms to do the research for my books. What help and support is there available for those of us who have only just arrived back in the country and don't have that three years of being in a certain place um, nonstop? The ones that actually go out there and get our dreams and make them happen instead of just sitting in one place. Great question. Thank you. So, well, from, from a Welsh government perspective, I would say Hayley's here from Business Wales. So there's the platform. You only have to be based in Wales to access our support. You need an address in Wales. Uh, Final Rentals, uh, the national who runs that is uh, Pakistani. And he moved to Wales from Poland and we were able to support the business immediately. 
Um, it's about turning around and having those relationships. There's a whole set in terms of the new exporter program, but the generic business support available through the likes of Haley, who, if you put your hand up, Haley is in the corner. Um, and perhaps have a conversation about how we might be able to turn around and facilitate that access into our support. But as I say, you've also got the support through the likes of Felix at the FSB, David at Chambers of Wales, uh, and through just, uh, Jason's team as well from DPT. Even though you've only been back in the country, as long as you are a base, you have a base in Wales, you have a business registered Wales, and you're physically based here, you can access Welsh Government support. Thank you, thank you. And you might benefit from coming to our workshop on the 26th of November um, to take that conversation forward a little bit more. Okay, thank you. So Julian is online. Julian, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Yes, good morning, everybody. Um, my, my question relates to the exchange rate and dealing with uh, the currency of choice. And I think Stephen said uh, sometimes it's a good idea to use the buyer's currency rather than sterling. Um, there's a lot of risk in that, as the universities recently experienced with, uh, I believe it's the Nigerian students where they had huge inflation. What are the, some of the factors? Could you just expand a little bit on some of the factors that would need to be considered on what currency should be used? To answer that again, to answer that question honestly, uh, managing an, an, a currency risk where you can is if you can basically buy and sell in the same currency, that's always going to be beneficial in terms of matching the receivables against any payways. Other than, other than that, it can be quite difficult, being honest, but it can give you a benefit in terms of the actual pricing of the product that you're selling to sell in the, the buyer's currency. And there are ways in conjunction with um, either your bank or a foreign exchange broker where you can actually mitigate that currency risk uh, through, through the use of something like a, like a, 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 a forward contract, um, depending what the value of the transaction is. Uh, all be except, I would accept that for small amounts, again, it can be quite difficult, but there are ways to mitigate the currency risk. Thank you. That's, I, think that's, I think that answers your question, Julian. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Next question. Thank you. From the floor today. Good, uh, good morning. Uh, Gary Rawlings, MD, the Tame UK Limited. Um, can you hear me? Okay, good. Uh, first of all, to, to Paul, um, when I first went to the UAE, it was in 1981, so you, it's changed then, uh, absolutely. To Steve, it's good to hear that for small and medium-sized businesses, you're now going to bring out a new way of um, giving extra our money for export. But what uh, the last gentleman who phoned in, what I cannot grasp is that I'm working in Africa and uh, mainly in Ghana and Nigeria and in Ghana they want to pay uh, with the CDs and we have a factor in, I'm, I'm working through a factoring company here who's taking the CDs in and then converting it into sterling. Now I don't know if there's any mileage with the Welsh government having this facility as well, or access to it, I'm quite, uh, uh, I, I will give that information to you a little later on. But uh, have you come across that type of um, way of um, exports being paid for? Thank you. Well, being honest about it again, in terms of a number of African countries, they have a limited amount of foreign exchange available, which is why they have exchange control, which I mentioned before. UK used to have exchange control back in the late 70s, uh, but uh, Margaret Thatcher um, abolished it. Uh, and simplistically, it meant that, means that for to obtain foreign currency, you have to basically apply either through the commercial bank that you're banking with or directly through the central bank for larger amounts for, for foreign exchange through the actual central bank for it to be allocated. 
against, against uh, documentation. And the reason they do that is to, is to um, monitor the inflows and outflows of foreign currency going into that particular uh, country. I would accept that that's something that would happen in Ghana. There's a lot of it going on at the moment in Egypt, in, in North Africa, where there are quite strict controls. So, and the, the government are also by that, because they're knowing what they're physically paying for, they can prioritize what they're physically buying as well. So they can make sure that the key projects that they want to manage are, shall we say, fulfilled first. Thank you. Have we got time for one more question? I'd like to try and squeeze one question in. Sharan's online. She's been waiting patiently. Sharan, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question, please? Hi. Uh, good morning. Uh, this is Sharon. About myself, I have studied from Cardiff Business School, um, uh, which was in 2020. My question to the panel is that I, being uh, an Indian, I had an idea, which I still have. Uh, this is around tax liability, number one, and hand-holding financial support from the government to the international entity. Uh, uh, so my business um, uh, approaches towards importing items from my country and finding a demand within the university setup. Uh, being a student from Cardiff University, I, I can see that there are uh, scarcity of uh, items which is useful to students. Uh, but do you think this is viable and uh, I can be helped in some way? Oh, thank, thank you for the question. Those questions. Thank you. They're multi-faceted, that one. So I'll just start off is that any university operates like a public sector um, body in that with the way that we procure. So there's no call, cold calling. Uh, we have um, a very um, strict procedure that we follow with all procurement. And if you have a look on the Cardiff University webpage, um, you can actually type in procurement and you'll find our supplier page. And then there it gives you very clear instructions on how to trade with um, universities, not just Cardiff University. You'll find that most of them, I get this kind of question on LinkedIn all of the time. Everybody thinks that I buy for the university and they all want a quick route in. Um, so I think it's a really valid question and it's great to have one coming from a different perspective about how you how we import as well. But definitely you need to think about the procurement um, approaches that we take um, as a university uh, and the responsibility that we have to do that in a fair way. But thank you. Would anybody else like to um, add anything in there in terms of importing? Because today's focus is much more around um, how we export and develop businesses in Wales to export. Any, any other? No? I think that's quite a good question to round off. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, hi. Uh, I think from an importing perspective, then the, the, probably the most important thing is to make sure that there, that there is a specific market for the product. Um, and if you're looking specifically for finance, particularly the early, early days in terms of a, of a new venture, then any sort of financial institution that's looking at even a small amount of lending would, would want to see a well put together business plan with, with cash flows, projections, et cetera, et cetera, even if, it, even if it's quite a new venture. Um, we're also fortunate in Wales in the fact that there are organizations like the Development Bank of Wales that will support uh, small business and, and new business. And within um, Welsh Government as well, there are um, other programs such as the Innovate Programme and the Accelerator Programme for companies that would qualify. Thank you very much. So that leaves me to wrap up the morning and um, I, once again to thank all of our speakers. So please do show me a round of applause there to thank all of them for their time today. But also just to highlight again that we will be inviting you to um, a workshop, a follow-up workshop, where you get the chance to, spit, to sit down and um, talk through some of your dilemmas, challenges, ambitions um, with um, a really qualified team um, to help you. And we're happy to host that 26th of November, 2 p.m. So we'll give you the contact details now. Thank you. Oh, thanks so much. Thanks, Jane. Thanks, everyone. Really great. So... Thanks for coming. I think it's really clear how much support there is available to help brilliant 
Welsh businesses to make sure that their products and services are available around the world. So the challenge is go out and seek these opportunities. And we've got all the people here that are really helpful and willing to, to get you part of these programmes. And, you know, we wouldn't, Cardiff wouldn't have Sarah Lethbridge without the Export Credit Guarantee Department moving to um, Cardiff in the regionalisation of government offices in the 80s, because my dad used to work for Export Credit Guarantee Department. So, um, yeah, exporting has me, has to thank for me for coming to Cardiff. So thanks ever so much. And um, thanks for joining us today. And there might be a tea or coffee available and hope to see you at a future event. Thank you.